Hello, and thank you for joining us. This is a We Do Talk with David Jakes. Hi, welcome to another We Do Talk. I'm David, and we're continuing our theme of mental health, mental well-being, and awareness. In the past, I focused most of these conversations on adults, but today we're here to talk about an equally, if not more important demographic, and that is our young people. I'm delighted to have with me today, Brian Kroon. Welcome, Brian. Thanks for being with us. Thank you so much. Pleasure to be here, and what a great topic. I'm happy to talk about yeah. it. And, uh share some ideas. Brian has spent uh, most of his career as an educator, school administrator. Mm -hmm. Brian, would you give us a little bit of an overview sure. on yourself and what you've done? Yeah, I studied music and went on and started my education career as a music, music teacher from fourth grade all the way up to college level. Did that for about 15 years and then shifted gears into administration. Became an assistant principal, principal down in San Diego for a number of years and up to San Francisco for three years, was principal of a public school up there, then over to Oakland, principal of a school there, or ex executive director there, and then off to Bullis for um, the, the position there that I'm just wrapping up now yeah. as an interim superintendent. You and I are probably around about the same age, mm -hmm. so I'd imagine that you know from the days when we were students to mm -hmm. today, mm -hmm. there's been some pretty dramatic shifts. Massive changes, yes. In not just how education is done, and we could probably do a whole series of podcasts right, right, on right, that, right. but sure. looking more at attitude towards mm. mental illness, which, mm -hmm. you know, certainly when I was in high school mm -hmm. and I had some mental health issues myself, sure, it was clearly not understood, mm -hmm. kind of pushed away into the background. Mm -hmm. And the way that children with mental health issues mm -hmm. and, and illness were dealt with was that they were typically sent to special schools, special right. education schools that right. specialized in yep whatever special need it was. Mm -hmm. Would that happen today? Is that the sort of thing that happens today or is everybody more mainstreamed? I think you, you put your finger on it, uh, sort of the big two big changes that I think from what you're describing as what it was like when we were in school back in the day and where it is now. I mean, we've shifted from that model of moving kids off to a different place and isolating them with other kids who have particular challenges to understanding that mainstreaming kids and, and doing the least amount of that possible is really important for their success. Having them mainstreamed as much as possible, it's good for everybody involved. That's been a real attitude shift over the years in terms of you know how to address kids that have different mm -hmm. kinds of challenges. That piece is significant. And then the other part of this where we're recognizing a lot of these things that were certainly around in the day, but were either unnamed or un under, you know, not understood well. I have a friend of mine, she describes when she was in elementary school, she's my age, she was taken to the doctor and because she's, and she's very much an ADD person. I mean, she's been diagnosed and all of that, right? But she was told as a child, girls don't get ADD. Hmm. That's what the, the mental health care professional did. So I, I don't know if it was a malicious thing. I doubt it. But it just reflects the kind of understandings that have shifted over time that, you know, yeah. you know what mental health um, challenges look like and, yeah. and how they manifest. And, yeah. and know, there's probably kind of some gender bias or had been gender bias. Oh, yeah. With, um, you know, boys being shown to be weak or... No question. You know, the macho image that was expected to be out there. You know, I, I attended an all-boys school for mm. a while that just didn't work out for me. Right. Which is why I ended up moving. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I, I call that my misfit years. Yeah. Which <laughs> some of the kids would have said, you know, you're off to a school for misfits. Right, um, right, right. But when you look at the word, I, I didn't fit into that mainstream environment. Exactly. So I needed to go somewhere else. Yeah. But the special school that focuses on, mm -hmm. on kids in need, with certain needs, mm -hmm. in some ways, I can see there's a benefit there because mm -hmm. you have focused teachers that are trained in that particular discipline right. that would, would right. really provide that nurturing right, environment. Right, right, right. So probably not all bad. No, no, by no means. And I, I don't mean to portray it that way, I, but it's what it... What it used to look like was like this is a way to just sort of push the problem, or we don't we'll put we'll put it put it over there and not think so much about it. Now I think it's used and evaluated much more specifically to the individual to say, okay, is this the right best environment, least restrictive environment? You hear a lot in this in education. Is this the right environment for this child who's struggling with whatever their, their issues may be? Yeah. So it's looked at as a tool, a useful tool, but not a catch-all, be-all. Yeah. Now we don't have to think about it. 
Yeah. As it might have been back then. Yeah. Now, if I'm right, you've spent most of your career as an administrator in mm -hmm. high schools. Mo yes, yes. Okay. Yeah. So, and in the last couple of years, you've, mm -hmm. you've worked with younger kids in elementary yes, yes, I have. and middle school. Sure, sure. Are there different issues when you look at things that might come up with the younger kids versus high schoolers who are teenagers? They're different because, <laughs> it sounds kind of funny, to, I never use the term this way, they're age appropriate. In an, in an odd sort of way. It's like they're the same issues, but they manifest themselves differently at different ages. What you see a lot of, around the school environment, particularly in, well, it depends which kind of school you're at. You see different sorts of things, but anxieties and depression and a lot of the things that can become so powerful and, and change the day-to-day -day life of a student, you certainly see that in young kids and you'll see it in high school kids. And you see it in adults, of course. Yeah. It just looks a little different at different points of development, like you know you, you would expect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, high school is is tough enough. Yeah. Anyway, high school. I mean, my gosh, high school is really tough. Yeah. And it's really hard on kids. And we've done a. I don't want to say a good job. There must be a better way to say it. We've done a, an a, a complete job, an effective job of making it very stressful. For kids with the pressure they feel around, you know, the whole college application mm -hmm. thing, being eligible, the competitiveness, it's really, in my opinion, gotten out of hand. And mm -hmm. the big problem, I mean, fundamentally, is we've sort of abdicated responsibility for high school to colleges. And now you look at most high schools and the graduation requirements, the college entrance requirements is set by the UC system, college board, etc. Not by the high schools, not by the districts, it's by right. the colleges. So it's a strange dynamic that we've set up here that's very hard on kids because as we all know, for some that's okay, for many it's not. And that's a lot of pressure to put yeah. on kids. Yeah. Well, you know, kids are no different to adults. You get some that probably thrive in a highly competitive right. environment, uh, you know, whether it be sports, mm -hmm. academics or whatever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they always want to do that Go right. that extra mile and, and love achieving something better. Mm -hmm. And others, I can see how it would be so intimidating, it could really oppress them. Well, yeah, and it's not, it's not a question in my mind of achieving something better. It's, it's really a question of we've narrowed this definition of achieving something to such a little tiny box yeah. that is essentially UC in California, right. UC requirements. That's it. You can do great you know, world changing things that don't necessarily fit that box. But when you're in high school, it's yeah. not, it's not supported. It's yeah. not recognized. You got to fit this little box. Our view yeah. is so narrow. And I think that's hard on a lot of kids yeah. who don't necessarily want to be in that box. Right. Well, my, my son is going through this exact thing right now. Yeah. He's a senior in high school. Yep. So he's yep. in his last year of high school, he's going through his college applications now. Mm -hmm. And and he was faced with this all along that, yeah. uh, you know, if you want to meet the UC, CSU, so for mm -hmm. the benefit of somebody not in California, that's right. uh, University of California and California State University systems, that this is what you have to achieve. Mm -hmm. And early on, he kind of threw it out and said, well, I'm not applying to schools in California. I want to go yeah. someplace else. Yeah. I want to experience something different. Yeah. So, you know, this art class that I haven't satisfied I don't care because I'm not going to do it. Right. So he right. has that opportunity, which yeah. is great, but yeah. you know, for not everybody does. No, they don't. And it, you know, it can quickly, particularly when you look at these systems that have such systemic biases, yeah. it can quickly put pressure on different groups of kids that make it doubly difficult for them to feel any sort of success there. And when you, when you're in a system that does that to you on a regular basis and layer in all the other things in the world, you know, mm -hmm. that can, that can put that kind of pressure on that can be really hard on kids. And, and you see a lot of, I've seen a lot of very, very anxious, stressed out, depressed kids withdrawing from the system, feeling overwhelmed, feeling helpless, feeling hopeless, all of those things, because they just don't fit this model for whatever reasons. Yeah, yeah. And they don't want to fit it. Right. You know? And understandably, yeah. why should they have to? Yeah. There's more than one way to, <laughs> to move through life, but yeah. we've narrowed it so much. It's, it, kind of heartbreaking sometimes. Yeah. Now, one of the things which I find very encouraging and mm -hmm. you know, living through the elementary, middle, high school mm -hmm. life anecdotally through mm -hmm. my kids mm -hmm. 
is when I hear about some of the things that are being done、mm-hmm. that are very positive. And one concept that、uh, I first knew about、mm-hmm. at, at Bullish Charter School was Challenge Day, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and that is now practiced in the high school. Yep. And it sounds a little daunting. Is、mm-hmm. what is this mm-hmm. challenge? Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. basically, the challenge is, as, as I understand it,、mm-hmm. is to open up conversation. Yep. And and not just about. I'm feeling depressed. I mean, right, that's, right, that's right. only a, a small、right. part of it. But giving kids the opportunity to talk about, I've had death of a parent.、Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. There's been drug abuse in my family. There's been a suicide in my family, and how I feel about it, and that it's okay to talk about this in a safe environment. Sure, sure. Yeah, I've been through Challenge Day. I've been, at, you know, when I started the high school down in San Diego, we we got Challenge Day right from the get go, and wanted to make sure every student that came through that high school. Participated in Challenge Day at one point along the way, because it's it's an incredible thing. It, and your point's a good one. What I took away from it is, yeah, it's not so much just you know I'm depressed or I feel bad or this that or the other. It was really more about not feeling isolated, because one of the things I think that's so hard when you're struggling is you feel alone. You feel like nobody under there's no you know, nobody gets it. Nobody understands because you don't even understand. You know, you're in the middle of it. I have a daughter. I've I've been through this pretty firsthand, and explaining what's going on is very difficult, and you feel very alone. Challenge Day is great at getting a group of people together, breaking down all of the different sort of things we put in front to to, to present ourselves to the world, and saying, "Yeah, here's the things I struggle with. Here's the things you struggle with. Hey, you know what? We all are struggling with a lot of things." And frequently they're the same kind of things. And even、yeah. if they're not, we all understand what it means to to be struggling with something. And Challenge Day is really good at that. Yeah. The key to it, though, and and this is the the thing, like with so many things, is you can't do this one and done. And that's what schools often do, which、mm-hmm. is we hit Challenge Day for a, you know it's a day or two or three. We we get you know however many kids we want, and then that's it. Doesn't work if there's no follow up. If you're not paying attention to then what comes out of it, and then supporting those kids that clearly need continuous or you know further support. Yeah. And and like with so many things, if you don't do that, yeah. Yeah, it's a. I don't want to say a feel good day. It's it makes you feel good. You did it for the school, whoever put it on. But the long term effects are severely like compromised if you're、yeah. not following up. Yeah. Yeah, and. and- One of the things I would hope is a, is a product of that、mm-hmm. is some of the kids recognizing that just by being a good friend、mm-hmm. to another kid,、mm-hmm. they're being supportive. Absolutely. And 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 I I do remember one example. My 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 daughter said this is now several years ago. If she learned something about someone,、mm-hmm. and she was very clear to say,、mm-hmm. but I can't talk to you about it because、mm-hmm. this is nothing、yes. nothing that happened in that room. I'm allowed to talk about outside. Right. right. But something came up about this particular person,、mm-hmm. and I realized that I need to be more of a friend to her because she needs help and she needs support. Yeah, and that empathy—you know—if we can engender that empathy in the way they absolutely. think, absolutely, very powerful. And and that's sort of the other side of the same coin. Everybody, in different ways, has struggled with different things. The other side of it being, and everybody needs that kind of support you're describing.、Yeah. Everybody needs to feel like they belong, that they're not alone, and that we need to reach out to each other, kids in particular, because it's it's a new thing for them to sort of get、right. their heads around it. Because it's really, I think, high school where you really start to grapple with the world is more than just me. It involves all of those people around me, and what is my role and contribution to the well-being of those that I interact with on a day-to-day basis? And I think your point's a really good one. Learning to reach out, understanding the importance of it, and part of it is because when somebody does it to you, you immediately feel better. You understand、right. how good that feels, and, and、yeah. turning it around and doing it for others.、Yeah. Whereas when you're a little kid, you're used to getting it from your parents and all the adults. But as you sort of grow into adulthood, you're starting to look at okay, now it's kind of Incumbent upon me to be doing what you're describing, being、yeah. supportive as a friend and、yeah. a caring human being to those around right. me. Right. Now, to what extent, as a as a principal,、mm. have you seen warning signs in kids and had to take note of something's not right here? Well, you see warning signs of all different kinds. I mean, the, the ones you would expect, you know, changes of behavior, drug use, whatever it might be. You know, withdrawal, anger plays out. It's really challenging to sort out 
what is going on because why a kid may be behaving the way they are could be for any number of reasons, one of which could be real, you know, significant and, and important mental health challenges. It could be social elements that are at play. It could be cultural and community and all of those. And it's generally all of those things layered in on top of each other. So untying that knot and getting any understanding is challenging, as, as you well know. But it can manifest from that all the way up to suicide. Yeah. You know, and that, you know, is the thing that terrifies us all, that we don't figure out what's going on soon enough to stop that from happening. Yeah. Unfortunately, it does. And it's, it's, it's you know, it, it's so, and in teenagers, we know that's such a huge problem and it's such a terrifying situation. And I don't know anybody in education who, who doesn't worry and, and try to figure out how do we intervene when we know a kid's struggling. Right. Because we know how often kids really need serious help. Yeah. And, and then, you know, it's obviously the responsibility of parents as well. It's everybody's responsibility. Yeah. I mean, it's certainly the schools. But if the, the notion is, and sometimes you hear this, and I've heard it as a principal many times, it's like, you know, somehow it's your exclusive responsibility to figure out how to solve this problem. Mm-hmm. Well, no, it's not. It's my responsibility to do everything I can to help. And it's yours too. And it's yours too, and it's everybody's responsibility because otherwise it's not going to work. Right. You know, you can't look at the school or a principal. I used to get phone calls in the morning. My kid won't get out of bed and come to school. What are you going to do about it? And you're just like, you know, you're almost speechless. Like, well, you know, I, I'm. Where do you even start in that conversation? Yeah. yeah. And and that's when a parent is looking at you as if you're going to solve all the problems. What works is when a parent looks at you and says, okay, how can we be partners in helping support this, this young person? And sometimes I think it's the school's responsibility to start that conversation and say, you know, initiate that concept of we yeah. need to work together here. Yeah, yeah. You know, and if the parent's open to it, then, then you can, you have a shot. And, and many times I'm sure, you know, what might be seen as strange, erratic, out of character behavior could be a cry for help. Absolutely. Absolutely. It, it's in, and cries for help can be very blatant. I've, I've had a, st- you know, students who get a test back in class and immediately go harm themselves. They walk out of the class and go do self harm. Yeah. Well, that's pretty clear. There's something serious going on here, but it can also be subtle. You know, generally, and I say this carefully, generally, you know, parents are the, the one on one with the, the, the individual most of the time, if they're paying attention to it, they're going to see stuff. Yeah. You know, they're going to see things. And if there's good communication with them towards the school the teachers, primarily because they're the first line and the one that the students are most connected with generally, then you can see those, you can hear those cries for help. Yeah. You can see those changes in behavior, even the subtle ones and start trying to figure out what that is all about. Yeah. I remember the time, it's kind of an anecdote here, but the, the son of some family friends mm-hmm. just kind of disappeared from high school for the last few weeks of the year yep. and nobody knew what had happened. And this mm-hmm. was a kid that this was, was not, you wouldn't expect this to be happening. You know, out of concern, mm-hmm. um, I was talking to my wife about it and said, mm-hmm. I wonder what's going on. Mm-hmm. And, and she said, maybe a drug issue. And mm-hmm. It's funny, my immediate reaction was, no, not that family. That would not happen mm. with that family. And then mm. I stopped and thought, how many times has that been said? Mm. That this would not happen to that family. It can happen to any family. Nobody is. And in fact, it, it wasn't a drug issue. It was a mental health issue. And so, yeah. um, and unfortunately, um, you know, this particular person got help and is doing well. Yeah. But a- again, I think it's that vulnerability that mm-hmm. people are surprised at sometimes, mm-hmm. especially when... You know, a, a kid is seen to be achieving well in other aspects of life mm-hmm. and something just happens. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, what you, you just described is not uncommon, unfortunately. And it, it, I think it comes from our sort of biases or our, our predispositions towards what we assume about people and students and communities. In particular, I've worked in super high achieving communities with lots of money. And I've worked in, in, been principals or director of schools in the middle of the cities. It doesn't matter where you're at. Those issues are there. Now, they, they might look a little bit different at the, high, at the sort of high, wealthier schools that mm-hmm. I've been at. 
it's a lot of prescription drug, drug abuse. Mm. It's a lot of designer drug abuse. Yeah. And, and, and availability of money to and, go out and exactly. buy things on the black market. Yeah. As well, which, so there's that going on. And right. sometimes because, you know, there may be more school pressure in some respects, it's hidden a little differently. But it's still there. Yeah. And if a student's looking for it, and, and that's, that's the question I often used to get from parents was, well, are there drugs at the school? And I go, well, there's drugs in the world. The school doesn't live in a vacuum. It's not on a separate planet. So wherever you go, they're there. Yeah. And if a student is looking for them, they'll find them. Yeah. yeah. I don't care what school you're at. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm sure. You know? But we have this notion sometimes of, well, this group of people or this group of kids at this school... That wouldn't happen to them. Well, I'm here to tell you that's you're fooling yourself. It yeah. can happen anywhere, anytime with anybody, and it does. Yeah, and and as I say, same with with mental health. And, yes, absolutely. And, and one of the things that uh, you know I always try to describe to people is you know there's a big difference between you're feeling depressed because you're having a bad day. Mm. You know, just something mm-hmm. that happens that day makes mm-hmm. you feel a bit down, but tomorrow you feel fine. Right. That's you know purely situational, but if it's something much longer term that is impacting your life, impacting you physically, unable to sleep, not yep. enjoying the things that you once did, these are the symptoms that there's something deeper and that really counseling and even medical help mm-hmm. sometimes is necessary. Mm-hmm. And the other thing that I always say is it's no different to a physical illness. Yeah. You know, yeah. if you have a phys- I mean, if you have a rampant stomach ache, mm-hmm. You go to a doctor, yep. you get your stomach x-rayed, mm-hmm. you find out what's wrong, you change your diet, you do something. There's no shame in that. Right, right. Similarly, if you're suffering from mm-hmm. depression, mm-hmm. any other variation of the disease, it's a mental disease. Yeah. Addiction is yeah. a disease. Yeah. There's really no difference that you have an illness and well, illness it, can be treated. One of my biggest learnings, if not my biggest around this topic, is you know, well, certainly going through, because in my own family with one of my own children, had to deal with this and still do. I mean, it's not mm-hmm. something that necessarily just goes away, right. um, but you learn how to handle it better and manage it. And she was, you know, it was early high school and she was experiencing what you're describing. She would go and she would find herself very depressed and all of a sudden disconnected and feeling very, very hopeless. And, and she would shut down completely. And I kept trying to figure out well, what's wrong. Mm-hmm. What happened? What's the deal? Like you said, are you, what are you depressed about? And it took me a long time to understand that's entirely the wrong question because she doesn't even know. Right. And it's not a cause and effect scenario here in terms of this event happened, therefore she feels this way. No, she feels this way because that's what's going on in the chemistry and in, in, in the whatever's happening in her own, in her own mind. And st- for me, it was saying, stop trying to find the problem and fix the problem because mm. it doesn't work that way. Yeah. And it took a long time to realize, oh, no, this is a disease. This is an illness. And it requires a whole different kind of approach. But right. being a dad, being a parent or being a principal or being whomever, you see if somebody's suffering, you want to fix it. You want to fix the problem. Did somebody say something? Did something happen? Yeah. No, if it was only that easy, but it's not. Yeah. It's a whole different thing. And so I learned. Mm-hmm. And I learned, yeah, it takes work, it takes time. But I also learned, and this is, I think, something I, something I know I've shared with parents many, many times who are going through something similar. I said, but it's not hopeless. And when you see your child suffering, understand it will take time, but you can come out the other side of it and be in a better place. Learn the tools you need to manage it, do the things you need to do to live a happy, healthy life. Yeah, you know that's a great piece of advice. It's not a terminal illness. No, it is something it's that's not. treatable. Yeah, it's absolutely treatable, but it's not something you put a band aid on in the afternoon and by tomorrow morning they feel better. Yeah, yeah. You got to understand it's, it's, it's time. Spe- yeah, exactly. Especially as you know, much of the medication that's used can, can be very effective. Is not instant. No. It's, sometimes it can take two to three weeks to try a medication only to find that's not really working and then have to switch to something else. I've been down that exact road and that's one of the things I also share. I go, and when they start prescribing medication, if they decide that's appropriate down the line, that takes time to find the right combination, the right things that'll work. Be patient, be present, be there, let them know you love them, stick to it, you know, hang in there. Be the good parent that you are because you wouldn't be standing, you wouldn't be having this conversation with me as a parent 
if you didn't care and weren't connected and trying to do the right. right things. Just hang in there. Yeah. Because you can come out the other side. And I'm living proof of, you know, it was the most scary thing that ever happened to me, for yeah. sure. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I didn't, I felt so helpless. Yeah. And I'm sure, you know, being a parent has helped you be a good principal and Absolutely. being a principal has helped you be a good parent. Yeah. Oh, no <laughs> question about it. No question about it. And it, I think it's helped me and this isn't about me, but it, it helps you relate with parents who go through something yeah. similar because they're feeling alone too. Because as a parent, who do you turn to to talk to? Right. You know, because the pressure and the, the, the cultural pressure amongst kids is certainly there amongst adults too. Yes. So who you share this kind of information with can feel very uncomfortable depending on, you know, a lot of factors. Yeah, yeah. And so and any, anything else, Brian, that we should mention here? No, no. I, I, I think I want to commend you for the work you're doing. I think it's really important. I think it's often ignored. And I worry about that we pay attention to what's going on with our children. Yeah. You know, because it's not the same as it was. The pressures are enormous. The great things that are happening are also there. Yeah. These are brilliant kids doing amazing things. Things inconceivable that we would have done back in when we were in high school. So there's great hope there. Good. But we have to pay attention. Yeah. And, you know, this is November 2020 for anybody mm -hmm. that's watching at some other time. I can't not ask you about COVID mm. because that's probably overwhelmed your <laughs> year as much as it's overwhelmed everybody else. Yeah, everything's changed. Huh? Um, how, what new challenges has this brought about for, for people's mental well-being? Probably, I mean, I'm seeing it among adults yeah. of how the disconnection, yep. you know, lack of socialization, mm -hmm. human interaction, which is something we're, we're, we're sociable animals. We're mm -hmm. human animals. I mean, I consider myself somewhat of an introvert, but mm -hmm. I still love the company of my friends and family. Yeah. Yeah. And we're not getting that right now. And that, that's a very unfulfilling part of life. Yeah. And I think it's particularly challenging as young people are going through sort of the, the developmental stages of being eight or 12 mm -hmm. or 15. And what does it mean? What do you learn and what are you gaining from socialization that we're used to at those right. ages? And what's the impact of not having it in the same yeah. manner? I don't know. I mean, yeah. we'll find out. I guess we're finding out. It's hard. Yeah. It's yeah. hard. It's very difficult. It's going to have an impact. And I think it's going to have an impact on education, too. Yeah. You know, it's going to change that model in some ways. Um, I, I don't think it'll ever be quite the way it was. Yeah, maybe. You know? Well, it's an ever-developing model. For so, sure. So we shall for see. Sure. Brian, thank you again for, My pleasure. for chatting to me this morning. Anytime. Um, this has been great. And uh, thank you, everybody, for watching. And we'll sign off here. And I'll just say be safe and be well. Thank you. We upload a We Do Talk every week, so if you enjoyed this video, please subscribe and leave your comments below. Thank you.